Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Join the Patreon to support the channel, follow me on Twitch to watch me stream, and like and subscribe for better RNG next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building the Lamb from Cult of the Lamb, a little lad who serves a horrible powerful entity by trying to amass followers in one site and subject them to terrible things until they die. I'm writing this in November of 2022. Twitter is dead by the time you see this, just know that Cult of the Lamb is a decent substitute. Taught themselves to be a cow. Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need to build a party. Maybe we'll have them build a campfire or eat a poopy. Next, we need some curses, a little magic to kill those mean elder gods who tried to sacrifice us. Can you imagine being so cruel you would just sacrifice one of your followers? Finally, we need to get some weapons and put a little extra sauce on them. Tell Gordon I found the lamb sauce, and it was on a massive axe. For stats, we'll be using the standard pointer right from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep your multi-classing minimums in mind. Charisma will be number one. Your followers need to do anything you say, or you'll sacrifice them willingly. Dexterity next. I don't want to play a game where I can't dodge roll by pressing circle. Wisdom after that. You need some survival skills to handle the survival aspects of the game. Fall out with constitution so you die less. That can make your followers lose faith. Intelligence is a bit low. You get told the lore throughout the game. We'll dump strength though. You might swing a big old axe sometimes, but we won't really need it for that. The lamb is a reanimated anthropomorphized lamb close enough to a goat, so I'm gonna go Reborn Satyr. Bump your Charisma by two and your Dexterity by one. Your Deathless Nature gives you advantage on death saves and saving throws against being poisoned, as well as resistance to poison damage for some Mithrandithithum. I don't think, I didn't say that right. I'm not trying it again. You also don't need to eat, drink, or sleep, but your followers still do. Your knowledge of a past life gives you a pool of D6s equal to your proficiency bonus you can add to a skill check. Probably use them on your Persuasion checks. From your Ancestral Legacy, you get two skills you would normally get from a Satyr, so that's Persuasion and performance, and then you can grab two more skills from your background, like survival and acrobatics. You need to plant some carbs so you have enough energy for a dodge roll. We'll kick things off as a warlock, letting us grab two more skills like deception and intimidation, which means you officially have all the charisma skills, whatever it takes to get followers. As for the pact, I don't totally know what the one who waits should be. The iconography says fiend to me, with the pentagrams everywhere. Lore-wise, it feels like a great old one, but y'all know I'm not an icon or a lore expert, I'm a mechanic. So we're going for hex blades, since it's the most mechanically consistent with the powers the lamb gains. Your hex warrior, letting you pick a weapon to make attacks with charisma instead of strength or dexterity, has to be one-handed, but we'll get something for that later. Basically, this will just let you mix up the finesse and non-finesse weapons with spells, and not have to be quite so mad. We're still going to be pretty mad. Hexblade's Curse lets you pick a creature to get some true sight crits with, critically hitting them on a 19 or a 20. You can add your proficiency bonus to the damage of attacks you make against them, and you'll heal an amount equal to your warlock level plus your charisma modifier when you kill them. Hey, it's also a vampiric weapon then. Fear Cantrip's Eldritch Blast will give you a generic magic blast fire, ranged spell attack that deals 1d10 force damage. There's a few options for that in the game. True Strike will give you a charged up attack, letting you spend an action to give yourself advantage on a weapon attack next round. It's pretty bad, but it lets you remind your audience that cults are bad but unions are dope. For your first level spells, Armor of Agathus will give you a diseased heart with five temporary HP. When a creature hits you with a melee attack while you have that temporary HP, they take five cold damage. It is, in my opinion, the best scaling first level spell, not only adding five more temporary HP, but also increasing the damage by five. I think it's because it's exclusively from the Warlock list, since all Warlock spells are cast at max level, kind of makes sense. Highly recommend upscaling this later. Arms of Hadar will give us some otherworldly tentacles, forcing a strength saving throw on creatures in a 10 foot radius. Failing that, they take 2d6 necrotic damage and can't make reactions until the end of the next turn. This is the only tentacle spell we're going to be able to get. I wish we could get a Vard's Black Tentacles, but that's only on the Great Old One Warlock list or from the Wizard list, and we just don't have the room for it. Second level Warlocks get invocations, some tarot cards to boost you up. There's quite a few that would work for the Lamb. I'm going to grab the ones that fit in and give the abilities we won't be able to get other places, but you can swap them out every time you level up. Armor of Shadows will let you cast Mage Armor at will for AC equal to 13 plus your Dexterity modifier. The ability for this in Cult of the Lamb is called Shield of Faith, but that's a different spell in D&D, so it's a bit awkward. Agonizing Glass lets you add your Charisma modifier to the damage of your Eldritch Blast attacks for some more potent curses. For this level spell, Shield will give you a Divine Guardian, raising your AC by 5 as a reaction. Third level Warlocks can choose a Pact Boon. We'll grab the Pact to the Blade to expand our weapon 
weapons to include two-handed things, and you can conjure the weapon to yourself as an action. So boom, axe, dagger, sword, whatever you like. I like sword. We can also learn second level spells. Hold person forces a wisdom saving throw on a humanoid, telling that they're paralyzed for up to a minute, letting you automatically critically hit with attacks made within five feet of them. Just lock them down with that divine force. Also swap out your agonizing glass for improved packed weapon to give yourself plus one to your attack and damage rolls with your packed weapon. Then just grab agonizing blast again later. Four level warlock skin ability score improvement. Charisma is probably the most important, so let's invest in that right away. It kind of does everything right now. Shadow Blade is the closest we can get to a weeping moon, summoning a sword that's light finesse and has the throne property, deals 2d8 psychic damage, and has advantage on attack rolls in dim or dark light. It's a great way to get a run in at night. Fifth level warlocks get another invocation. Thirsting Blade lets you make two attacks instead of one with your action, but only if you're using a packed weapon, so it doesn't work with Shadow Blade. Oops. The third level spell we're taking here is Spirit Shroud, letting you add a d8 of cold, radiant, or necrotic damage to attacks within 10 feet of you. Creatures you hit can't heal, and their movement speed is reduced by 10 feet. It's a little death squall that makes you harder to get away from. Sixth level hex blades get a Cursed Spectre, letting you raise one creature you kill per long rest as a spectre for a little necromantic weapon. It also gets temporary HP equal to your warlock level and a bonus to its attack rolls equal to your charisma modifier so it should still be able to hit end game bosses for this level spell vampiric touch will give you some vampiric claw weapons letting you make a melee spell attack that deals 3d6 necrotic damage and you can heal half of that just slurp it all up we'll get something for non-vampire claws later seventh level warlocks get another invocation but just swap in agonizing blast you can also learn fourth level spells like dimension door letting you teleport with another creature 500 feet i guess i don't know how far away your camp is but you need some way to get those followers back Back to camp safely. A level warlocks get another ability score improvement. Let's cap off that charisma modifier for the best uh everything that you do. It's not like you're a monk. Hex lets you deal a d6 of necrotic damage with your unarmed attacks for some claws, but that's just because it'll add a d6 of necrotic damage to all of your attacks against a creature and give that creature a disadvantage on ability checks of a certain type. But this is how we're getting melee attack damage because mixing warlock and monk would be such a bad idea. First level monks get martial arts, letting you make unarmed attacks using your dexterity modifier. They deal a d4 of bludgeoning damage and you can make one as a bonus action after you make an attack using a monk weapon as your action. A packed weapon can be a monk weapon as long as it's a simple melee weapon without the heavy or two-handed property. You also get unarmored defense, making your AC 10 plus your dexterity and wisdom modifier. When you're not wearing armor, it's not going to be as good as mage armor. We just don't have a lot of room to invest in the wisdom. Second level monks get unarmored movement, something we're here for a little bit more, making you faster when you're not wearing armor to let you get on the path for a little speed boost. You also get key points you can use to do cool lamb stuff like patient defense to dodge as a bonus action. It's always good to hit a few attacks and then roll away. Step of the Wind lets you dash or disengage as a bonus action with double jump distance. It'll help you with your jump despite your low strength. You did miss out on the Seder jump with the Reborn lineage. Kind of a bummer. Flurry of Blows lets you make two unarmed attacks as a bonus action instead of one. The Claws are weak, but their power grows when they get a combo going because Hex makes combos better, adding a d6 to every attack. If you have Hex on a target, your unarmed attacks are basically dealing a d10 of damage. Basically, I know a d4 and a d6 isn't a d10. I'm just saying basically. It's a similar amount. Third level monks can deflect missiles, letting you reduce the damage of incoming ranged attacks by 1d10 plus your dexterity modifier and your monk level. If you drop the damage to zero, you can even throw it back by spending a key point and just disregard death. Speaking of death, long death monks get touch of death, giving you temporary HP equal to your wisdom modifier plus your monk level when you drop a creature to zero HP when you're within five feet of them. It's a nice little gift from below. Fourth level monks get another ability score improvement or feat. We're going to grab the poisoner feat, letting you ignore resistance to poison damage. You can coat a weapon in poison as a bonus action instead of an action, and you can make some poison that coats a weapon for a minute at a time, forcing creatures to make a DC 14 constitution saving throw when you hit them with a weapon, taking an extra 2d8 damage and poisoning them until the start of your next turn if they fail. I think the DC should scale with a soft stat, but 14 isn't all that bad, especially for an extra 2d8 poison damage, and especially because you have an expanded crit range from Hexblade to double that up to 4d8. Or you could hold person to get automatic crits, but then you can also have Hex up for 2d6 extra damage when you crit. Basically, there's a lot of different combos you can make, kind of like you can with the lamb. You also get slow fall, letting you reduce falling damage by five times your monk level as a reaction. Everything's kind of flat in Cult of the Lamb. I just wanted the ability score improvement, and you get this little thing to protect your lamb legs along the way. We're not done multi-classing though. Divine Soul Sorcerers are favored by the gods, letting you add 2d4 to a failed attack roll or saving throw once per short rest. Just because your god is a little evil doesn't mean they don't like you. Here we can grab four cantrips to cover some curses that we're missing. Ray of Frost is a ranged spell attack that deals 3d8 cold damage and slows a target by 10 feet. 
Firebolt is a ranged spell attack that deals 3d10 fire damage. Poison Spray forces a constitution saving throw on a creature dealing 3d12 poison damage. And Thunderclap forces a constitution saving throw on creatures within 5 feet of you dealing 3d6 thunder damage to those that fail. For first level spells, Magic Missile will shoot 3 darts that deal 1d4 plus 1 force damage each, and you don't have to roll for it, it's just a nice little hunting specter. Ray of Sickness is a ranged spell attack that deals 2d8 poison damage and forces a constitution saving throw on a creature. Failing that, they're poisoned until the end of your next turn. It's an ick spell for sure, but later we'll get something that's ick -er. Second level sorcerers get a font of magic with sorcery points you can use to recover spell slots, or you can convert your spell slots into sorcery points. That's going to get really good with Warlock, since those slots recover on short rests, especially when we get meta magic next level. And we're going to skip the spell here, because I want something later. Third level sorcerers get meta magic, letting you augment your spells with sorcery points. Quickened spell lets you cast a spell as a bonus action that normally takes an action, essentially turning Eldritch Blast into a curse Gatling gun when you stack it with Hex and Hexblade's curse. Heightened spell gives a creature disadvantage on saving throws against a spell you cast to make sure you're getting that hold person off. We'll grab two spells here since we didn't grab one last level. Scorching Ray fires three ranged spell attacks that deal 2d6 fire damage each, which can all be buffed with Hex and Hexblade's curse. Ceremony will let you perform a bunch of different rituals like an atonement, you can bless water, you can do a coming of age ritual, dedication, funeral rite, or a wedding. Check out the spell list in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. There's so many fun things you can do and this will let you perform rituals. Also, it's a ritual spell, so it's a ritual that does rituals. Rituals on rituals. Fourth level sorcerers get another ability score improvement. Let's start working on that dexterity for some better dexterity stuff and AC. For this level spell, Rhyme's Binding Ice is better than Snowlock Snowball Swarm in virtually every way. Forces a constitution saving throw on creatures in a 30 foot cone. Failing that, they take 3d8 cold damage and can't move. Half damage and no restriction if they succeed. It just really points out how bad that spell is. It's bigger, has more damage, and a very good secondary effect. Never take Snillock Snowball Swarm. I'm pretty sure Rhyme's Binding Ice is on the same spell list as anyone who can learn Snillocks. Fifth level sorcerers can learn third level spells. Fireball forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 20 foot radius. Failing that, they take 8d6 fire damage, half damage on a success. Sometimes you just want a big bomb. Sixth level holy solis get empowered healing, letting allies who are healing roll their healing die with advantage for one sorcery point. Sometimes fortune really just gives you a blessing. For this level spell, enemies abound forces an intelligence saving throw on a creature. Failing that, they can't tell who their friends are and will attack randomly. If they can make an opportunity attack, they have to. This is going to be for all of our crown abilities. We're not going Oath of the Crown Paladin. It's just another ability in the game that shares a name with something from D&D. It's wild that that happens so often. Seventh level sorcerers can learn fourth level spells. Death Ward stops a creature from hitting zero HP the first time they should, hitting one HP instead. It doesn't require concentration. It lasts for eight full hours. That's just kind of the deal you make with the Eldritch Abomination. Gaston is the eighth level of sorcerer for one last ability score improvement. Cap off your dexterity modifier for maximum claw attacks if that's your thing, but also for better AC. For our last spell, we're going to head back to the third level for Stinking Cloud. I know Icker is more of a pool than a cloud, but the only pool spell would be Grease, and that's not poison. This makes a 20-foot radius sphere of poison gas, forcing a constitution saving throw on creatures inside. Failing that, they have to spend their action getting sick. Honestly, I think it needs some damage, especially because it can be blown away with a strong wind. Slow is a better third level spell for debuffs, but I needed the Icker, and this spell is sicker. Now that we hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, mixing Warlock and Sorcerer gives you so many extra sorcery points, and the Eldritch Blast Gatling Gun. It's powerful. You're also surprisingly bulky with temporary HP every time you kill someone, an upcasted Armor of Agathis for even better options, and healing when you kill your Hexblade target. Finally, you have a ton of damage variety with Poison, Force, Necrotic, Fire, Cold, Thunder, and Standard Physical Damage. If your enemies have a weakness, you'll hit it. And if they have resistances, you can avoid them. For weaknesses, you got too many concentration options, so you're gonna have to pick and choose what you want to use. You're also a little squishy. I know I just said you were bulky, but that's after you get some kills. Until then you're rocking just over 100 real HP, so power word kill could take you out pretty quickly. Finally, some of the spells are on brand, but they're not that useful. True Strike and Stinking Cloud particularly swap those out for something better at home. But you're still rocking the power of a god and a cult. Lead your followers and do some deicide. Just hope that none of the gods are holding a ninth level spell. Otherwise, you'd be led to the slaughter like a, uh, oh, what kind of, what kind of animal gets slaughtered? Oh, holy cow. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, subscribe for more. We make new videos all the time. Follow me on Twitch to watch me stream and sub to Tulak and Mango for more Tulak fun.